What image gets conjured in your head when you hear the words book fair? Maybe a festival for readers and lovers of books to come get their favourite books signed by their favourite authors and line up outside a big gazebo or a big main hall. Well, that's the picture I had in my head recently until on my course, a publishing master's at uh, Edinburgh Napier, um, I learned that in the world of book publishing, a book fair means a big industry event and there's only a few really big ones in the world. And as part of my course, I was recently at one of them, the London Book Fair, and you may not be surprised to know, I went on a little bit of a hunt for kind of all things Chinese or Chinese language at the book fair, and I wasn't disappointed and had a really great time, so I thought I would make this fourth episode of the show about it. So, um, let's crack on. I'm Angus Stewart, and you're listening to the fourth episode of the Translated Chinese Fiction Podcast. So before we launch right in, I'd like to give you guys a, a full picture of our show's online presence, just so you know what to, to share to your friends. Um, so the show's hosted on SoundCloud, and that's where our RSS feed is drawn from. But we've got quite a lot of, we're listed on quite a lot of the other um, podcasting platforms, probably just about all of them now. So if you're in, SoundCloud's not your cup of tea, and that's where you're listening right now, well, you can do better because you could listen to us on Spotify or you could subscribe to us through iTunes. Apple, sorry, not Apple, Android users could get to us through just about any of the big podcast apps. I'm a Player FM user, so I always make sure that Player FM is uh, listed and updated with every new episode and all the details. Google Podcast has us. Google Play Podcasts for people in in the US. That should have us now. If there's any podcast provider you use that doesn't seem to have us, let me know and I will make sure that we get listed there. There's also an Instagram account and I, I'm an Instagram addict. So um, if you want to follow us on Instagram, that's the best place to kind of get updated with what I'm up to, what's coming up in the next show, how progress is going. So anyway, the Instagram handle is, it's a little bit of a tricky one, tr tr because I couldn't put the full name of the show. So T R C H F I C T R for translated C H for Chinese F I C for fic. That's the that's the Instagram. I've made a page on my main website. Uh, my main website is dustsymbols.tumblr.com/hello, and there's a page on there for the show. I'm going to be expanding that in the near future. Also on the horizon is a Patreon website. Um, where you can donate to the show and the reason I'm going to launch that is pretty soon I'm going to run out of free hosting space on SoundCloud. Um, Unfortunately it's just not free to put up lots of audio files onto the internet and get an RSS feed. You gotta you gotta pay for it eventually no matter who your podcast host is. So to help cover the costs of SoundCloud Pro which I'll be buying probably by the time of episode 5 I'm going to give you guys a way to help the show out. So if you can Keep an eye on that, and I'd really appreciate the support. You see how the music stopped there? It got all serious. Scary, right? Money. Anyway, so yeah, I was at the London Book Fair, and my purpose there was two, no, no, let's say threefold. So the first fold of those three folds was my dissertation. So I've decided that for my, well, from in the third trimester of my course, we have to do a dissertation. Uh, on any topic one wishes and I thought I would do translated Chinese fiction because you know it's an emerging market it's an emerging world power and kind of the the world of rights um, so the selling of books the right to sell books in different languages or different regions from when they were first published is kind of a area that's getting a lot more focus than it used to especially for uh, stuff coming into the English language because um English language is, you could say it's a net exporter. A lot of books get translated from English and sold in other languages around the world, but there are not so many imported books from foreign languages, especially non-European languages, and it means there's a big gap in what native English speakers read. So any study in this area, I think, is going to produce fruits and be worthwhile. So that's the first fold. The second fold was for this podcast. Um, I wanted to see what um, what I could learn, any juicy nuggets, talk to anyone interesting. And I did. I did talk to some cool people. I'll get on to that. Third fold was just 
it gave me a, a purpose and something to follow according to my interests because at these book fairs there's a lot of agents and publishing companies and professionals and they they all want they all want to be spending their time doing deals for the most part and if you're just a student you are not the priority it's not for you and you might have trouble catching people's attention but if you've got some sort of a mission so my and some kind of an elevator pitch of yourself so mine was hi i'm a master's student at blah blah university i'm planning to do this blah blah dissertation can i ask you some quick questions that's usually if you're polite and friendly and seem really interested in whoever you're talking to that worked if i'd just been going up to random companies and saying hi what do you do i'm a student you know they might have brushed me off a little bit more. So I had quite a positive experience um, going around um, chatting to all these people with actual jobs and handing out my business card and trying to plug the podcast as much as I could, um, like the soulless individual I am. And yeah, it worked well. So I'll tell you that the, the first part of this tale uh, involved myself and all my course mates looking at the London Book Fair website and thinking, oh my goodness. What do we do at this place? Um, so what I did on the website, and I can't speak for my course mates, is I looked up um, the list of the publishing companies who were going to have exhibits, like stands around the hall. And I looked at uh, international publishers uh, like One World and who, who do a lot of translation. And some of the companies who publish books I really like. So for example, Head of Zeus, who do... Uh, basically everything that touches Ken Leo and Leo Tsushin. So these are like kind of in the Western market. Ken Leo is the big translator of Chinese science fiction. He's edited, uh, I think, two collections of Chinese sci-fi short, short stories now. He's a he's American Chinese. Uh, he writes his own fiction in English. Uh, but then also Leo Tsushin, who is the author of The Three-Body Problem. So anyway, Head of Seuss does, does those two guys. So they were on my list. But then I was, I was also looking at publishers who'd come to the fair from China and Chinese speaking areas. So China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore. I never actually visited any Taiwan stands. And the one Hong Kong, com- quote, Hong Kong, unquote, company I went to see were actually a, Shen- a Shanghai China company, with but with an office in Hong Kong. Um, I'll get on to them. Um, I did have some really interesting interactions at the exhibit of the Singapore Art Council's stall. So not a publisher per se, but we'll get onto that too. So yeah, I I had all my exhibitors researched, and most of these exhibitors had the attending delegates, or at least a few of the people who'd be at the exhibits, listed. And there's a me- there's like an email or a messaging function within the website. So I thought, you know what? what have I got to lose here? And I tried messaging a total of about 25 of these delegates and absolutely no response. Um, I didn't take it personally. Probably what's more likely is people don't really use the site to contact each other. They probably just use conventional emails to get in touch beforehand. Or I was too late. Or as a student, no one could be bothered replying. But I think that seems unlikely because you'd think out of 25 people, even if it was, even if they all thought, oh, a student, I don't really care. At least one of them would have bothered to reply. But yeah, my, my ego's intact. So we're all good there. Um, the other thing that the uh, fair has going, which is a bit more friendly for students or casual attendees, although you wouldn't really want to be a casual attendee because, so student attendance costs 30 quid. Um, if you're not a student, it's like the same price as a music festival, I think, like 180 quid, possibly multiple hundreds. Um, yes. So perhaps just to add some entertainment or some interest, they have these different seminars around different spots in the hall, which made me really feel like a music festival, kind of like going to the, between the different stages. A few of them are were like quite practical industry insights, how to get ahead in this or reveals of stats from that. Um, others were a bit more fun. Well, there was quite a lot of author interviews and author talks and what have you. So I made a list of like two or three of those per day I wanted to go see. So it was a, it was a three day event and there, there was a conference I attended beforehand. So I was there a total of four days. 
So the biggest group of publishers I went around visiting was probably the state-owned ones, the SOE, state-owned enterprises. And these are quite different from a lot of the other book companies present um, because, well, compared with smaller countries like Latvia, there'd be like one Latvia stand which would have little displays from lots of different Latvia publishers. China being a bigger market, there was no one China section. They had quite a lot of large sections which would group several kind of different state presses within it. So, for example, the CIPG publishing group would have several different regional state publishers from China within it. And these exhibitions were also pretty heavily staffed. Um, some of them were seemed to be doing a lot of business. They'd have visitors, like obviously visitors from other companies or other parts of the world would be sitting down with them or they'd be sending people out around the room. There was one or two that seemed to be staffed with people who weren't particularly busy or were just talking to each other. Um, Perhaps it was a chance for these different different people from different Chinese companies to meet, even though that they'd come, they'd all come all the way to London. Couldn't really tell. Um, so the, those the ones at which I did approach, everyone was quite nice to me. Everyone had time for me. Not everyone had great English, so usually someone would come forward who felt comfortable talking to me. Because although I had enough Chinese to make small talk, um, I really had to kind of if I wanted to talk to these people about complicated publishing -y things we did need to use english <laughs> should probably study harder um yes there was one interesting thing one of the publishing groups um was having events uh in their exhibit so events within the larger london book fair that weren't listed on the london book fair website i was walking past one of these uh exhibits and i saw there was some sort of a talk going on and i, I saw booze and i thought oh am i entitled to any of this booze um and what it was, was it was a launch party for a collection, well, a translation of the entire body of work into Chinese, uh, of all the work, by Agatha Christie. And Agatha Christie's great-grandson um, was in attendance, as well as the translators and the foreign publishers, although I couldn't tell how many of the Chinese delegates were able to follow the speeches, because there was no translation, it was all just in English, and quite rapid not non-native speaker friendly English, so couldn't tell just how normal or strange that situation was. One thing I noticed about these state publishers is quite a lot of the books they were selling perhaps did not look very appealing to um, foreign publishing companies, or, you know, they're only going to buy a book from these guys if they're going to turn a profit and generate interest. And a lot of the books the state publishers had on display were academic things about, like, finance, economics, the governance of Chinese regions, quite a lot of books on the Communist Party and its like structure and uh, hist history and whatnot. And although these topics could be of interest to Western readers, I just don't think they're going to buy a book on such a topic published by a Chinese state publisher, because, you know, how reliable is that going to be apart from to give you um, one particular perspective? Um, the interesting books these companies had would would tend to be like their history texts or their mm -hmm. they did have some interesting fiction i've got a message there from a fan he's bugging me stop bugging me it's alex from australia bugging me there um yeah so they did have some interesting books for adults but i would say these were in the minority there was a couple of the publishers who just had row upon row of xi jinping's book the governance of china that didn't seem like a commercial move that seemed like face you know just saying hi we're here this is us whether the publisher wanted to do that or not is a question i suspect they probably did but that's just speculation yes um i did notice that these for, so from speaking to some of these uh, delegates from these soes and from just kind of watching where they were going they seemed to be very interested in buying in educational books um particularly books on uh, learning English, but also lots of other topics. There seemed to be a faith in Western textbooks on particular subjects, um, also children's fiction. Um, there was an interesting talk an Indonesian author gave about uh, the views in Indonesian society about how um, children's fiction should be for kind of moral instruction more than enjoyment, although 
there has been recently an address to balance the two. And I had a really interesting conversation about that with a guy whose business card I have, but whose name I don't immediately recall, from one of the state, the Chinese state publishers. And he said he, he thought they were really interested in buying uh, in foreign, buying and selling children's fiction in of and out of the Chinese language and China um, because of its usefulness for raising children and, you know, giving them some ideas. And I suggested, you know, it's also good to help children appreciate books rather than just, you know, interview. and he agreed. And we agreed that, you know, the story needs to be interesting and exciting as well as moral. So although in certain parts of the world, that kind of balance towards informing children versus entertaining them is tip one way, I think basically people have the same understanding that a children's book should teach your kid something, but if it's not a fun book and they don't enjoy it, then it's kind of a wasted mission. A little global consensus for you there. Um, yeah, so that's the state publishers. And next thing I'll talk about was another another state company, but a much more interesting one. I think they were government funded rather than government guided, let's say. They were called the Arts Bridge, and they're a project, I, th I think, I believe they were launched by Guangxi um, Normal University, so university from the south of China, but based in Shanghai. And they were selling arts books by various Chinese artists. I couldn't really, I tried asking the people from the Arts Bridge, um, which, like, which Western publishers are you trying to sell rights to, or what are they interested in? Didn't really get any information about deals, but they told me in terms of art, um, Western buyers are more, were most interested in the kind of modern Chinese art that didn't necessarily have anything uniquely Chinese about it. Um, and their more traditional style art that was like very specifically Chinese and also rooted in the past was not something that really drew in Western buyers. Um, and in that little chat, we kind of agreed that the most interesting stuff was stuff that was um, modern, but also had some kind of things in China, things from China you just wouldn't see coming out of other countries. Although later I mentioned this conversation to Jeremy Tiang, who I'll get to, and he he basically thought any, any art or culture that kind of makes an effort to sell that particular country's local culture is kind of twee and crap. And I'm sympathetic to that because I live on the Royal Mile in Scotland and there's a lot of Scottish, Scottish gift shops and bagpipes and what have you. And it's ironic because this is the least Scottish city in Scotland by quite a ways. And yeah, a lot of it's tat. And um, one might argue it's a bit corny to be pushing your country's traditional culture in your um, in things like art and global book fairs. But bouncing back to the other hand, West uh, Chinese culture is very diverse. It's been around a long time. There's a growing interest in China in the West, and there's a lot of modern and classic Chinese art Westerners have got no idea about. So Anyway, I'm on a very long tangent now, so I'll just move along. Um, uh, so, international and Western publishers. Now, these guys were busy, busy, busy. I went by quite a few stalls. I mentioned some of them earlier. So, Heads of Zeus, the guys who are kind of spearheading getting Chinese science fiction into the West. One World, who do translations from all over the world, all sorts of languages. They've got quite a few Chinese books in their front list and their back list. Uh, front list being books that are new and they're putting out, back list being everything from their publishing history. Um, yes, there was them. And I went to go seek out No Exit, um, who I believe are part of Castlefield Books. No Exit, if you remember, were the guys who published two of Wang Shuo's books in English. And on episode two of the show, we did um, Please Don't Call Me Human. So I wanted to go and sit down and ask those guys about Wang Shuo. It was just a desk with two people but literally anytime I went they were engrossed in a chat with each other or more likely doing deals with a third person sitting at the table or they were off on walkabout doing deals with other big publishers so never got a word in I did get a client I did get a glance at their books catalog uh, with their front list and possibly all their backlist but I didn't see any of their older books there because um please don't call me human that's from I believe the early 2000s they published that and I didn't see it in the backlist. So whether they've just it's just pushed so far back they're not selling it or not pushing it anymore 
or not doing print runs, or whether they've sold the rights on to somewhere else. I don't know. But um, if I had caught them, I would have <laughs> grilled them about that. Why have you forgotten Wang Shuo? Why are you not pushing him? Eh, they're perfectly entitled to. It, it is quite far back in the past now. Yeah, but I, I, on that note, I don't think I did see any other Chinese authors in their list. Or did they perhaps have one book that was by a West, in English by a Westerner set in China? I think they did, yes. But it's up with outside the bounds of the show, and honestly, that's probably a less, a less remarkable thing to see than a book written by a Chinese person for the Chinese market in Chinese making it over here. That's, to me, now anyway, that's more interesting to me. So I did see a few Chinese authors um, speaking, two of them at the book fair, one of them at a sort of after event. So I'll I'll just mention them first, the two I saw at the book fair. So one of the... Um, one of the seminar spots where there were wee events you could attend was called the Fireside Podcast, where basically there would be sort of an interview or a chat format. And although I never saw mics, presumably it was being recorded for a podcast run within the book fair. And one of these was a conversation with uh, between one of the guys who runs the book fair, basically, and two, uh, two female authors from Shanghai, or at least based in Shanghai. They were Tung Xiaolan and Shu e Shu. Don't know what the tones are. I only have the opinion without tones. So do correct me if I said those wrong. Um, yeah, so this chat was an interesting one because it was done through a translator. And the guy conducting the interview, he... So bear in mind, I'm, I was attending this book fair as someone from outside the industry coming into the industry and someone from Scotland coming down to London. And... I'm certainly, you know, I'm certainly not from the working class, but you do feel at times you're walking into another world where this guy, oh, hello there, ladies, I'm I'm conducting this interview, just literally <laughs> sounded like that, big rosy face, um, totally self-assured, and just blundering his way through it, not pronouncing their names correctly, um, asking them all sorts of kind of um, ham-fisted questions, you know, in China. How oppressed are you? Can you really write something bad about the government? And of course, these ladies, um, their writing isn't political, so these questions don't directly concern them. But asking a Chinese author, are you allowed to criticize the government? I mean, it, what an odd spot to put them in. Because it's not really, first of all, it's not, you know, not every book published is political. Even even, even if it's a, a country which is not free, not every author automatically thinks, I must rise up. It's not how it works. Um, and do you really think these Chinese authors are going to take this moment at this podcast recording at the book fair to say, yes, it's so awful, we're oppressed, because they've got to go back to China. They're, these two ladies were um, part of the Chinese Writers Association, so they've got a salary through them, and they, they, um, they've been published in several Chinese journals. What? <laughs> anyway, they should have got an expert to interview these ladies, not this mildly buffoonish posh man. I've got to say, he was he was fairly charming, and he gave it his best shot. And I think if he'd been more in his home turf, he would have done a great job as the interviewer. But I was like shaking my head at various points. Um, you you could argue in his defence that it's it's good to kind of mention the elephant in the room about writing in China. But I felt that these two authors, they're, so they were writing like kind of family dramas. Um, yeah, fam family, literary family dramas, I would say. And if, he, if he'd gone for, you know, hadn't done the cliche Westerner questions towards the end of his interview, it would have been a lot better. He also should have learned how to pronounce their names. Sorry, man, like, you had one job. It's not, it's not the hardest thing in the world. Rant over. Okay, so the other Chinese author I saw, uh, this was an after event. Um, it was held at the Guanghua Bookstore in London's Chinatown, which, as far as I can gather, is, if not the only really legit bilingual Chinese and English bookstore in London and perhaps the UK, certainly seems to be the main one. And that does not mean it's massive at all. It is two floors. It is pretty jam-packed with books. But you know, it's it's. I think it's run out of love, and it, it it hosts lots of different 
events from uh, both Chinese authors and non-Chinese authors writing about China in both English and Chinese. And this di- after the last day of the um, book festival, book festival? <laughs> after the last day of the book fair, there was an event held there. So uh, me and my pal, we hopped on the metro down to Chinatown and we attended. So it was an author called Liang Hong with Nikki Harmon, uh, who I've mentioned before on the show, I'll be mentioning later on this particular episode, um, having a chat about Liang Hong's newest book, which is called um, China in the Liang Village. So Liang Village, um, just to give you the basic elevator pitch, it's a, it's a, it's a pseudonym for her hometown, um, which is a rural community which was kind of facing modernization, I think urbanization or industrialization, perhaps with the both of them. And the theme of the novel she kept restating was to give you a sense of the struggles and pressures people are feeling all over the world, not just in rural China or one Chinese village. And it was a very nice talk. Um, questions from the audience and from Nikki herself were a lot more sensible. I think there was one or it was also interesting to see. So there was, there were some questions about whether or not Liang Hong had got in trouble writing about some of the more uh, corrupt um, local officials in this village, and she answered quite a bit more directly than the two ladies had about such questions at the London Book Fair. And I wonder if it was because the questions were phrased more sensibly, or if she just felt more comfortable in this more private environment where everyone people just haven't wandered in um because they they see an event it's everyone who has a specific interest in that one event in that bookstore and also you know there's not necessarily going to be um it's not it's not being recorded it's not within a podcast so on the way out i picked up um a book i spotted on the shelves it was um invisible planets the collection of chinese sci-fi translated, collected, edited by um, Ken Leo. So expect an episode on that at some point. I'm about halfway through it so far. Oh, it's absolutely cracking. Anyway, moving on. So I'll mention the Singapore Arts Council exhibit at the London Book Fair. Something really, honestly, really awesome happened. Here. So I was pottering about. I was kind of on the hunt for Ballastier Press, a Singapore slash London slash international publisher who'd recently published um, Yan Ge's The Chili Bean Paste Clan, or Chinese name, uh, I think it's just Woman Jia, Woman Jia, Our Family, or Our House, depending on how you translate Jia. I think in this case it's Family, Woman Jia, which was translated, I believe, by Nikki Harmon herself, and she'd been online promoting it. And it seemed to be kind of the big, the big hit or the big name in Chinese to English publishing. And I did find it on the shelf at the, I think at Ballastier Press and perhaps the Singapore Art Council's exhibits. But just to point out, at this book fair, if you see a book on a shelf, unless it's the very end and they're being given away, you don't touch them. They're not for sale. Um, they're for display to show what the publisher has. Loads of friends were asking me, oh, what books did you buy? And it's like, it's not that kind of book fair. Um, so that that's why I bought a book from the Guanghua bookstore because it was actually a store. Um, I'm getting sidetracked. So I was kind of pottering about, looking curious, and a lady from the at the Singapore Arts Council exhibit said, "Hi, can I help you?" Which was nice of her because I clearly looked like a lost goon, too shy to kind of jump in on anyone's conversation. And I said, "Yeah, I'm a student." Blah blah. I'm kind of researching for a dissertation about translated Chinese fiction, blah, blah. And she said, hey, well, we have a translator right here. Um, why don't you come sit down? And she splopped me down at a table with, of all people, Jeremy Tiang, who, how I'd heard of him, was in research for this London Book Fair. I'd seen there was a talk at the very last day in the translation center zone, which had appointed Jeremy Tiang as its kind of symbolic leader and he was giving the final of talk of the final day and he's a so he's a singaporean chinese translator of chinese to english and he's also written his own books in english i believe and he's you know a respected literary figure and splat i just got plopped down right next to him so i had a chat um asking 
about the best people to seek out or the different kinds of publishers um, at the book fair. He's he's a funny guy. I think he's definitely a skeptic or a sarcastic person or a cynic. Um, so like he he was the one who made some disparaging comments about the state publishers trying to push traditional Chinese culture. And if you remember a few minutes ago, I compared that to like the gift shops on the Royal Mile here in Scotland in Edinburgh. Uh, he recommended to me Paper Republic, Nicky Harmon's website. Did he recommend anything else? I forget what else we talked about. Um, I think I did mention my podcast to him. He politely said, interesting, and no more of that. I, th- I gave him my card. Um, but yeah, I think he had bigger fresh t- fish to fry than me, so very grateful he had the time of day for me. Um, so fast forward to catching him at the last talk, and I didn't know Nicky Harmon was going to be at the London Book Fair. But I heard her name mentioned just over to my left. There she was. So I, I think I meant, clearly I'm mentioning this probably too often, but it was after Jeremy Tiang's event, I was able to say hi to Nikki, give her my card and have a chat. And it seems the end result of that is she posted about this show on the Twitter and Facebook of Paper, Paper Republic, her website. And that's got us loads of listeners and views, I think. Certainly there was a big spike right after she did that, so super grateful uh, for that. Yes, so that's everything about Jeremy Tiang and Nikki Harmon. And again, honestly, if you want to read some translated Chinese short stories or find lists of Chinese authors, any just go to paper, the Paper Republic website. I believe it's paperrepublic.org or pop it in Google. Awesome website, awesome resource. Um, yes. So the last thing I want to gush about was a private Chinese company I dropped by who I mentioned before here and on the Instagram account and I'm probably going to do an episode on, probably on one of their books. Um, So they're called Web Novel. And what they do, well, first of all, I'll explain. They they are kind of under the umbrella of Tencent, a Shenzhen-based company who are most famous for being the guys behind WeChat, the Chinese um, messenger app that pretty much everyone in China has. If you've been there, you'll know about it. If you've got Chinese pals, you'll probably know about it. Um, so Tencent has, on, in its holdings, a la- online light novel platform called Qidian, where um, Chinese online writers put their kind of online fan fiction or genre fiction. If, if you've ever been on Wattpad um, or fanfic dot, I forget what it's called, but this kind of online, lighter online novel style is massive in China. Um, and Qidian was a platform for it. But web novel is a, it's a branch of Qidian and you could say it's an international arm that people, where people write in English. Um, But also, the other thing Web Novel does is Chidian, I believe they employ freelance. I think they're freelance translators and not in-house. But they they get their translators to, well, they pick out the most successful or the most appropriate um, Chinese language Chidian novels. They translate them into English and they put them onto Web Novel. Um, Web Novel uses a micro transactions platform so um to read stories uh, you don't pay a subscription according to the netflix model I believe you just pay a little bit of money per book and then you get access to the full book and not just the first few chapters and yeah i was so taken with these guys that i popped by their stand i think two or three times just to ask them various questions um and they also did a talk that i attended which is where i learned a little bit more about their their um business model the micropayments and yeah I won't blab about them too long because I am planning to do an episode on them. But yeah, I, I learned some really interesting things. So, for example, the books that they that they um, try to make money from, they have to be selective. They can't pick anything that's too raunchy because, you know, a lot of online fiction can get quite raunchy. And it's not because of Chinese censorship. It's because they're sell- as well as trying to get readers from the Western world, perhaps readers who often are into, like, anime or east asian pop culture let's say probably some k-pop 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 fans on there um as well as selling to these westerners they also have readers in the wider asian region so countries like the philippines where people are already reading a lot of online fiction 
but also Indonesia. So the reason I mention Indonesia is the culture or the yeah, what's acceptable in Indonesia is far more strict than what's acceptable in China. So web novel, if, let's say there's basically a um, very violent, very sexual light novel. Web novel, they might let it go on the site, but they won't make it one of their own to kind of promote and translate because they have to kind of limit themselves by what's acceptable in their most conservative target market. Right, so in summary, web novel are really cool. I'll be doing an episode on them. I'll be talking about them in my dissertation. And I'm trying to communicate with them more. I haven't got a reply online yet, but <laughs> they might be fed up with me pestering them. I wouldn't blame them, but watch this space. Um, so yeah, that's all for the show today. If you enjoy the show, if you know other people who you think would enjoy the show, tell them. Tell your friends. Post about us. Um, spread the word, please, because the more people who listen, the more meaningful it is, obviously. The more we can reach the kind of people who would enjoy this show, the better. Um, yeah, but also, of course, the more people who are listening, the more inclined I am to keep going and keep making more episodes. Um, yes, so please, please, please be an evangelist for the show. But also, if I've got anything wrong, then do get in touch and um, let me know where I slipped up. If you've got a question, then don't be shy, just zap me it. Um, you can do that through the Translated Chinese Fiction Instagram, trchfic uh, on Instagram. If you don't remember that, don't worry, the link will be in the show notes. Um, yeah, it also, also very importantly, I don't think the best format for a show is just me speaking on my own into a microphone. I really want to get some co-hosts on here be it in person or more realistically through Skype. Honestly, whoever you are, whether you're the biggest expert in the world, whether you're the biggest noob in the world who's only ever read one thing translated from Chinese to English, honestly, if you'd like to talk about anything translated from Chinese to English, let me know. I'll make sure we've both read it, then we can talk about it. The only other requirement is that you're not crazy and don't want to murder me. So if you fit that description, fantastic let's collaborate so what's coming up on episode five i'm not gonna tell you you'll have to follow me on instagram to find out so remember trchfic t-r-c-h-f-i-c on instagram hopefully i'll see you there